All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Hoplite channel one more time. I am your host. Um, hopefully the lapel mic is holding up on this one as well, so we're going to keep using it. Uh, if you clicked on the video, uh, we are now in the third part of the three-part series to Stoic Titan Marcus Aurelius. So I decided um, I was going to use this part of the, uh, of the series to talk about Marcus's legacy. Uh, what he left uh, to the world uh, after passing away in 180 AD and um, you know what we can learn from that legacy um, as uh, as we understand um, the life work of this uh, Stoic Titan. So um, we have to talk about uh, before he passed away the legacy he sort of left on the uh, Roman Empire uh, as a ruler who came into his own. So we know from the record that um, there was a, uh, a brotherhood at the um, start of Marcus's um, rule. He uh, was co-emperor, believe it or not, with a man by the name of Lucius Verus. Now Lucius Verus was the son of the um, adopted son of Hadrian. So when Hadrian lost his adopted son, uh, that young man had a son, and that was Lucius Verus. So when uh, Antoninus uh, Pius became emperor, uh, his wish after he passed away was that the son of Hadrian's adopted son, Verus, would rule, uh, co-rule with uh, Antoninus's uh, adopted heir, which was um, Marcus Aurelius, his nephew. Uh, so the, the two actually ruled um, for uh, about eight years together. And this is an interesting point, is that uh, the Romans actually enjoyed the two rulers. Um, they, they saw this camaraderie between the two uh, emperors, and it was the first time it had ever happened uh, in Rome. And uh, Marcus actually honored this wish of Antoninus because the Senate was ready to confirm Marcus as the sole ruler uh, without Lucius Verus, but you know Marcus being the Stoic and wanting to honor the wishes of um, the man whom he loved, his uncle Antoninus Pius, he said, "I would not take uh, the the throne without Lucius uh, as co-emperor." And they agreed. And um, the the story goes that after uh, Lucius died, uh, he also, like uh, Marcus, died uh, on the uh, on the border uh, in a military campaign. Uh, it's believed that Lucius maybe died of smallpox or some other uh, illness, but Marcus mourned him uh, greatly and actually uh, rode out uh, to the Danube River where uh, Lucius uh, was, uh, had died and accompanied his body back to Rome. And after uh, Lucius uh, was, um, was buried, he held games in his honor. So that could teach us a lot that here you have someone who was literally going to become one of the most powerful, if not most powerful man in the world at the time. But the, um, the sense of honor he had for Antoninus to say he would not take uh, that, um, that throne alone because that was not uh, the prior emperor's wish says a lot about him. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, he left a legacy of 13 children. So uh, we know from the, the previous video um, Marcus um, married the daughter of Antoninus Pius, who was his uncle, so he married his cousin, right? And he had 13 kids with this cousin. And one of those kids was Commodus. All right, Commodus, yeah, let's talk about our boy Commodus for a minute. Uh, Commodus was born in the purple, uh, as it said. He was born uh, while Marcus was the emperor of Rome. And um, he lived that life of luxury. Uh, he didn't know about want. He didn't know about hardship. He was, he was a trust fund kid. You know, he was born into money. And um, he was born into the imperial palace and everything that went along with it. And Marcus, despite uh, any of the attempts he would have made to keep Commodus uh, from becoming arrogant and spoiled, um, you know, it didn't work out so well, unfortunately. They used to, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, uh, the Commodus apple fell way far from the tree and rolled downhill a couple miles. Uh, the uh, historical record of Commodus was that 
He was, you know, very, uh, he was vain. He was vainglorious. He fashioned himself a hero. He would actually hold games uh, as emperor after Marcus had passed. And he would take part in these games as a gladiator himself. And, uh, you know, who, who knew he was so great because uh, he won every single bout uh, in every single gladiator game uh, he took uh, part in, you know. Amazing, right? It's like the boss wants to play you one-on-one. -on -one. Are you going to beat the boss at hoops? Now you're probably going to shave a few points. But uh, he had this arrogance about him, and uh, he was corrupt. Uh, he gave himself to folly, and he was uh, committed to uh, this strange sense of iconography. Like he would take his head and have it superimposed on portraits and on uh, busts and uh, statues. And he had a statue, there's a famous statue of him, where he is draped in the um, uh, costume of Hercules, where he wears the lion skin and the olive uh, club. Just, just a real, you know, pompous ass. And uh, it all came to a head, uh, and I had to write this down because I found it hilarious, that uh, he wanted to uh, refound the city of Rome. As in, the Rome you know, had, had existed for many decades and centuries, but he said, you know what, uh, we could make it better. And uh, he wanted to rename Rome as, a, as it was refounded, uh, Colonia Lucia Ania uh, Commodiana. And, uh, you know, that Lucy could translate to Commodus land. Yeah. So Commodus said, okay, everybody, listen up. Rome is great. Uh, everything's great. Everything's beautiful. But it's going to be bigger. It's going to be better. Uh, we're going to win. And it's just going to be roses. Uh, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to name Rome Commodus land. It's going to be named after me. It's going to be great. It's going to be big. You're going to love it. Everyone's going to be a winner. Uh, trust me. Trust Commodus, uh, get on the winning team. Uh, yeah, uh, they, they, they did not see it that way. They were tired of this a-hole. So uh, in uh, 192, uh, a, a plot was hatched to assassinate him. And as I said, tyrants usually uh, don't go out uh, pretty. And even if they do, they're vilified for history. Well, Commodus got both. Uh, he was first poisoned, and when he retched up the poison... Uh, they sent in a professional wrestler to strangle him to death. So when they tried to poison him and that didn't work, uh, they sent in some big guy and he choked him out. So uh, Commodus died and that was the end of the Nerva Antonine dynasty, as it were. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> Commodus, being the product of a cousin marriage, could have had something to do with that. We don't know. But uh, that, that was part of Marcus's legacy and it's unfortunate because he was quite the opposite um, of his son and um, yeah that was the way it went but of course his most important legacy was what he left the world and that was the meditations right and uh, this this work has been translated into many languages and is enjoyed by many people we know this um, and if you look at all the other emperors, the, the legacies they left, if, whether they built the Colosseum or the Circus Maximus or Hadrian's Wall or Trajan's Wall, um, you have to go to Rome to see these structures, these amazing uh, architectural designs. But Marcus gave the world something that everyone could take with them. No matter where they were in the world, uh, his legacy could go into all four corners of the earth and be enjoyed for the centuries. You would not have to go anywhere to, in, to uh, soak up this knowledge or to enjoy this legacy. It, it could be brought to you in a book or uh, nowadays online. So uh, his legacy is meditations. Um, yeah, that, that one had profound impact on the world um, and uh, we thank him for it. And uh, as such, let's conclude part three uh, on Marcus by going into uh, some further readings of the meditations. Uh, I picked three more, and uh, you guys uh, can read along uh, as I uh, go through them. So we go to uh, Book 10, Chapter 35, page 108. And he said, A good eye must be good to see whatsoever is to be seen, and not green things only, for that is proper to sore eyes. So must a good ear and a good smell be ready for whatsoever is either to be heard or smelt. 
and a good stomach as indifferent to all kinds of food, as a millstone is to whatsoever she was made for to grind, as ready therefore must a sound understanding be for whatsoever shall happen. But he that saith, O oh, that my children should live, or O oh, that all men might commend me for whatsoever I do, is an eye that seeks after green things, or as teeth after that which is tender. All right, so what does that mean? Well, what he's saying there is pretty much what you, what you need to understand as a Stoic is that your eye should not just seek that which is desirable or that which um, is pleasing, like tender meat or green things, things that are ripe, things that are ready to eat. Um, you must take the good with the bad. Just the same as someone who says, oh, that my children should live or oh, that all men might commend me for whatsoever I do. Well, if your children don't live, and if men don't commend you for what you do, you still need to take that in, in stride and as a Stoic, understand that uh, the, the wise person does not just have the eye that seeks out the green or the teeth that seeks out the tender. Um, this is not the proper way to live in that we only seek out the good in life and we try to avoid or discard the bad. We must take everything as it comes, when it comes to us as a Stoic, and if wisdom is to be gained, we must know the difference between good and bad, between uh, ripe and spoiled. Right. Second reading. We move to book 11, chapter 7, page 112. And he says, A branch cut off from the community of that which was next to it is thereby cut off from the whole tree. So a man that is divided from another man is divided from the whole society. A branch is cut off by another, but he that hates and is averse cuts himself from the whole body or corporation. But herein is the gift and mercy of God, the author of this society. In that, once cut off, we may grow together and become part of the whole again. But if this happens often, the misery is that the further a man is run in this division, the harder he is to be reunited and restored. And however the branch, which once cut off afterwards, was grafted in, gardeners can tell you, it is not like that which sprouted together first and still continued in the unity of the body. Okay. So what, what is Marcus saying in this analogy here? Well, he's using the analogy of, of horticulture, um, the gardeners and the trees. Um, if a branch is cut off from a tree, um, it... You cannot just look at the branch as being removed from the larger branch of which it was once a part. It was also a part of the tree as a whole. Just as my fingers are part of my hand, just as my hand is part of my arm, just as my arm is part of my body. If I cut off my finger, I not only separate from the hand and the arm, but from the body as well. And what he was saying in that quote is that, if a man decides to sever himself from one man, he is severing himself off from society as a whole as well. And he would tell you that the more often that a man does this, uh, the harder it is to regraft him into society. When we separate ourselves from f our fellow man, we separate ourselves from society uh, in that same uh, action. And that, as gardeners would say, um, this is harder and harder for a tree to do is to re-accept branches that have been severed over and over again. You could sever yourself from the tree once or twice, but if a gardener is to re-graft you to the tree, um, only so many times uh, can that branch be severed where the regrafting uh, will be successful. And that's true. I actually saw a video um, of it was showing how a cactus... Um, could regrow limbs if the, uh, the diseased part of the cactus was severed and then the healthy part was regrafted after the diseased part had been cut out. And it, literally, you can watch the time lapse and it, it takes over and in several months you would, you would not even know that something from that limb had been severed. But if you were to keep doing this over and over again, the branch has no proper time to heal. And if it's always being reintroduced to the plant as a whole, um, eventually uh, the plant may come to reject this. It, it does not want this constant cycle of severing and healing, severing and healing. 
So he's warning people that if you separate yourself from society in the same way that a branch is severed from a larger branch, there's only so many times the gardeners uh, can be um, uh, able to regraft you back into the tree as a whole. So you should take care when you, when you take these steps to sever yourself off. Because as the Stoic would say, the universe is one part and we are but many parts of that one whole. Okay, last reading. This is page 117, book 11, chapter 27. And he says, In matter of writing or reading, you must be taught before you can do either, much more so in matters of life. For you are born a mere slave to your senses and brutish affections, destitute, without teaching, of all true knowledge and sound reason. Okay, this one's a good one to end on because it, I think it really sums up the whole purpose of reason and the whole purpose of logos and rationality as Marcus saw it as a Stoic. When you're born, you're, like, you're a child, right? You, everything comes to you via the senses. Um, babies laugh when they're uh, excited. They cry when they want something or have something taken away. But they can't comprehend deeper meaning because they haven't been taught yet how to read, how to take expressions, ideas, and thoughts and transmit those through reading. Uh, similarly, you cannot learn to write before you learn to read. So to learn to read is akin to learning um, th to take the senses and regulate them, to uh, use reason uh, as your guide in life and then you can use reason to read the world and by your actions you can write your own story. So what he's saying there is that you cannot write your own story as a Stoic using reason as your guide until you first learn reason. Otherwise you are just a slave to your senses and brutish affections uh, like a child who has not yet been taught how to use them. So you must first learn virtue and then you must practice it. Reading is knowing what virtue is. Writing is putting that virtue, what you've read, into practice. And that's the life of a Stoic from start to finish. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate um, you coming back and tuning in for uh, Marcus Aurelius Part 3. Uh, I hope I did him justice like I said I would. Uh, he really is uh, an amazing um, person to uh, look on as a model uh, of Stoic philosophy and, and a ruler uh, if you're in that profession. But um, yes, meditations, uh, absolutely 100% without fail must be in your library. And I would tell that to someone who's not just interested in Stoic philosophy. I think someone who is just curious about the world and why we think the, the way we do and, and do the certain things we do um, it would behoove them to, to read this work and to compare it against other sources of philosophy or knowledge. And I, I think they will see many common themes um, within Stoicism that they find elsewhere. But in any event, uh, I appreciate you coming by once again. Um, I'll do more videos on Stoicism, but this will conclude the, uh, the three-part series for the Stoic Titans. Um, I, if, you, if you enjoyed this one, please go back and watch Seneca and Epictetus. Uh, and the Primer series too. And uh, leave a comment below uh, if you found it useful or if you think I'm way off or I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I'll take the good with the bad. I can't just have a green eye and looking for pleasing thoughts and uh, compliments. Anyway, uh, see you next time. And until then, take it easy and take care.